Welcome everyone to the Nerd Generation Report, the Nerd Gen Report, where we talk about the latest and greatest news and items in the, in the superhero film and TV genre. Today, we have quite a few interesting things to talk about. Uh, a lot of news that came, that came out recently. And here to discuss those items with me is Mr. Brian Schultz. What's going on, Brian? What's going on, Pablo? Always good to be here. Man, a lot of good stuff to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about the Disney reorganization. Then we're going to talk about Spider-Verse. Tobey Maguire and Andrew are signing up because they haven't been doing anything. Toby's been playing poker. Garfield, I think the last movie he did was Hacksaw Ridge, or he did that movie about the hotels or something. I forget. Um, then we'll talk about Batman and the leaks that came out that are very interesting and has us quite excited. Um, and then we'll talk about um, Hemsworth wanting to be Wolverine. First up, Disney reorganization. Bob Chapek, uh, the CEO, just announced that they're going to be focusing a lot of their time and money on delivering content to the Disney Plus and their Hulu streaming service. Uh, these other arms of uh, th this reorganization are going to be creating content and they're all going to be funneled through uh, Mr. Kareem Daniel uh, to distribute them and monetize them as best as he can. So this is something again I'll reiterate that we have been in our previous podcast have, have been discussing that this was leading towards that that route, right? Um, I wasn't surprised by it, Brian. I don't think you were surprised by it. Um, this is good, but it can be bad, and we'll dive in a little bit later into that. What do you think about this reorganization? Well, huge news. So many angles here. So let's try to dig into a few of them. So number one, you know, Disney, like all companies, or many companies hit by COVID-19 this year. So, you know, the amusement park industry, the movie theater industry, so many parts of their business have been adversely affected. We saw the layoff announcement a couple of weeks ago, 28,000 people. All that money gone, baby. Right. So there's a little bit of, they're a public company. They've got shareholders, including an activist in third point who's their biggest shareholder. So there's a bit of, don't look at the mess that we can't fix right now because of COVID over here. Look at the future over here, which is in streaming. $3 billion. But, right. So third point saying, don't pay the cash dividend, which is $3 billion a year. Put that entirely into streaming product. And I think it sets up some really interesting possibilities and it sets up some really interesting questions. So my first prediction is like, I don't think Black Widow is going to be delayed again. I think when you look at Soul coming Christmas Day, a Pixar movie is now going to be available on demand. Getting great reviews. Getting great reviews. I think come next May, if we are in the same state of affairs with regard to the movie theater industry, I think Black Widow is going to Disney+. Plus. Um, and I think you'll see Disney more willing to do that. I think I have questions. Does this affect anything on the calendar? Do they look at a few of these properties and say, well, maybe we want to shift this to a multi-part streaming production versus a two and a half hour film? We'll see. I think my other question is, does this change the pricing of Disney Plus? Do you have a setup now where you're paying $6.99, you get the whole service. Maybe now there'll be a $12.99 tier, a $15.99 tier, but it gets you exclusive access or first day access to feature film product or different types of product. And then you wait, you know, if you're at $6.99, you got to wait six, nine months. And just like we used to have to wait for movies to come to HBO or come to basic cable. So I think there's a lot of questions there. I think it also want to give people a sense of just some basic numbers, which is if you're making a movie, you generally need to gross 2x your budget plus your marketing to break even so if you have a hundred million dollar budget you usually might spend 50 million in marketing you got to make 300 million dollars of global box and then you share half of that with the theater companies so then you sort of break even and anything you make above that is, is your profit clearly if you're putting on disney plus you don't have to share it with anybody so your break even points are different so yeah. what's that going to do to your to your marketing and your budget so i think that's also interesting i think this is also interesting for leverage Theaters need these properties more than ever. They yeah. rely on them. That's where 
that's where people are going to see their movies. They're not going to the indie films if they even get to the big screen. The, the mid-budget, the $40 million drama, that doesn't go to the big screen anymore. That goes straight to Netflix now. Irishman. Martin Scorsese, you kidding me? Martin Scorsese went to Netflix. Exactly. <laughs> he can't do what he wants to do. David Fincher's new mo- movie coming out on Netflix can't do what he wants to do in the studio world. So they, the theaters need these movies more than ever. So maybe Disney says, hey, instead of 50-50, Maybe it's 60, 40 now. We keep a little bit more of the purse because you need us more than ever. So of course. all sorts of possibilities of here, sorts, all sorts of questions. But this is a big, big move that is going to have ramifications across the industry in the next couple of years. I agree with all those points. Just to dive a little deeper in some of the uh, points that you made and the questions that are, are arising from this reorganization. Um, in terms of marketing, less, I think less money will have to be spent on marketing if you think about it this way youtube is where people most mostly spend their time at right and youtube is where mostly people see these trailers so how much money is it really costing them to 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 you know put it out there again all the social social media platforms that people are spending most of their time on how much think about it how much money are they do they have to put it on billboards do they have to put it on buses? Do they, have to, do they have to pay other entities to promote their stuff? Well, how much do they spend on trailers that go to the theaters right now versus they can just put the same trailer out to YouTube or just out digitally right away? Exactly. So I think obviously the way they do things kind of is evolving and it has to evolve for the better in that regard. In terms of movies, and whether you put them on in the movie theater, depending on how things are, do we go, are we going to miss out on that experience? I say yes. There are films that I'd want to see in the film, in, in the in the theaters. How many times have you said to yourself like, "Yo, I wish I would have seen that in the theaters," right? And. Black Widow is a movie that I would like to see in the theaters. I think it's going to be on par with The Winter Soldier. I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, and it being the first movie since Spider-Man Far From Home, like you want to see this in the theater, especially a Marvel film. Obviously, there are some films like, let's say, Ant-Man. Who knows if, if they decide. And I, I think you, you agree that Ant-Man is not sort of a movie that that gets you excited to go to the theaters and go see it, you just go see it because that's where it's playing and you want to see it. <laughs> but if they offered it on, on their streaming platform, yeah, I'd pay $20, $30, whatever to see it. You know, obviously you said in the past, um, Mulan didn't quite work out, but that's sort of like the test subject, I guess, right? Mulan, so, had, other, Mulan had other issues too. Issues yeah, yes, that yes. were unique to Mulan. So yes, I think yes, Disney yes. also recognized that and knew yes. they had a situation that was going to be difficult for them to navigate. So I almost, I almost view that as you, you, there's some things with that you can't extrapolate to anything on the Marvel yeah. side. Yeah. So listen, think about it. $3 billion. Think about how much money Game of Thrones had to put up to make these episodes. Think about the Mandalorian, how much money they're putting into each episode. We're talking $3 billion a year. How much of that $3 billion in content that they have to spend to make dope? And Disney that is the brand, you know, they've been around for years and, and you know them for quality. They haven't been perfect, but they demand or they want to put out good stuff. You know, and now you have the platform to put it on there. You know, you have 60, who knows how much next year, 70, 80 million subscribers, money coming in every year. And and if you break it up, like you're suggesting, people are going to pay. How many, how much money do people pay or used to pay? Hundreds of dollars, hundred, two hundred dollars for obviously internet and all this other stuff. But now... You know, to pay $30 a month for Disney, if you're giving me Marvel stuff that I can only see on that platform, what are we talking about? Yeah. So, yes, you can have my money, 
<laughs> and the stuff that they're going to be giving us, they have no choice but to do it. And they have the platforms to bring you that. So it's a no brainer to me. Do you think it affects the existing calendar at all? Like, do you think some of the streaming shows that maybe originally they were thinking would be one season and done. Do you think we now get additional seasons or do you think it's more, we just get more series. They go horizontal. They just get more properties, more things that we can choose to watch on the, on the, on the platform. I think it all depends on the popularity of the show and they can continue writing for it. And all, and I think it also depends on the story that they're trying to tell, because remember, Kevin Feige has always said that if you want to know what goes on in the movies, you got to watch these shows, right? These are the precursors to the big stuff. So if they want to do it this way, like really do it now, it, it, it'll be, I think it'll be an easier decision on, to, to decide what goes where. These big team movies, these big events, theaters all the way, however 100%. you can provide it. Yeah, no chance that changes, yeah. You know, so... But we, if we're still in the same situation where, you know, we can't go to the theaters and theaters are shutting down. Um, if, if we get to that state where we can go back, then yes, that, that leverage play, I think is going to be uh, played. And But if not, I think you look towards other means of providing that experience of going to the movie theaters. Although it may, may not be the same, It'll, I think, in fact, probably be different. Like, listen now to what Disney has. They have this Disney group watch where you can watch simultaneously with a bunch of friends. And the whole way we watch things are, are, is changing. So if they have to team up with a virtual reality company and do something where they can provide, because listen, if I have a family of four and I have four VR sets and only those v VR sets can watch this film, at $20 or $30 a pop, are you not going to pay it? Of course. And I, I think that hits on a really key point, which is I think if you're going to do a little less with the theater experience, then I hope that it drives them to innovate. And so maybe VR is a way to do that. But you know, some of my favorite filmmakers, whether it's Chris Nolan or James Cameron, part of the reason I love them is because of the presentation. So Nolan solved IMAX. He figured out a way to film big budget action movies with these large bulky IMAX cameras. And there's no substitute for viewing his movies in that medium. James Cameron showed us that 3D in the right hands is a game changing element for film. And then we saw it in the wrong hands for five years after that and realized that's terrible. But <laughs> with the right director, 3D changed the way we thought about the movie experience. So I just hope that whether it's VR, whether it's something different when we go to the theater, that Disney makes it count because they certainly have the resources. I think the other point I would just make is, you know, we're in this strange world right now where a lot of things remain shut down or kind of half in, half out. But Disney is a unique entity in the sense that they know they have a couple of cash generators sitting there someday. So when we get a vaccine or when people feel comfortable gathering in large groups, kids are going to want to go to amusement parks. That's not going to change. Oh, in yeah. some way. They want to go back. Oh, yeah. Toys are going to be sold on popular characters. Then, you know, Baby Yoda, you make a character like that, there's cash coming behind that. You win. So, yeah. Disney can do that in a way that the other streaming parents can't. So, Netflix, highly levered company, borrows a ton to spend a ton, but they don't have those other arms. You know, HBO Max, you know, they're leaning hard into the DC universe, but there is no merchandising at Warner's behind yeah. that. There is no amusement yeah. park. For the Justice League behind it. So it's just Disney's in a unique position to compete. And so I think part of this is they want to be at the front of the line. Of course. And they want to set the bar. That's going to push everyone in a certain direction. I think it also sets them up down the road for there's going to be acquisitions. Not we're not going to be dealing with these this many choices in streaming services. Because they can't compete. They won't be able to yeah. compete. So there's going to be some that get folded in, and Disney, I think, wants to be in position to absorb in the way that they were there to grab Star Wars, to grab Marvel and make them part of Disney. They want to do more of that. It all depends on the content they deliver. If it's outstanding that people are not going to, let's say, yo, Netflix got too much trash. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got good stuff, but yo, what Disney's doing 
couple that with their sports and all the stuff that they're going to be delivering. How much are you willing to pay for that and then pay for Netflix where you're there looking for stuff that you don't like? You probably watch a show or, or a movie. Those are hours you're not going to get back if they're whack. Well, Disney, my observation in the first year of Disney Plus, their curation is pretty good. Like if you're, if you're just perusing the properties and don't exactly know what you're looking for, they organize it pretty well. I don't know if you noticed, they, they even took the Fox Marvel stuff. Now that's called Marvel Legacy. So yeah, if you yeah. go on there, everything's been earmarked. So you know you're looking at a non-Marvel Studios property. Yeah. Netflix has always struggled with that a little bit. They try to use the algorithm to figure out what you like, but it does always feel like you're being overwhelmed with, with yeah. choices. Right? Yeah, yeah. So listen, we knew this was coming. Yep. Disney has... Um, made their claim as to what is important and, and the stock was up the stock was up a lot yeah, on the news man. so like the market and the investors talk at the end of the day they voted to say this was a good idea so don't lose sight of the fat fact i wish i would have gotten into disney but <laughs> you know the situation you know the situation you know where we work <laughs> so i'm not gonna go down that route but that news certainly like I would have invested in Disney because that's that's the future. That's the future, especially if they, if they can innovate and really provide a, a, a different experience than what other. Because you have to be different. You can't be the same and and have a slight difference. You gotta do what the other competition is not doing, which is delivering on everything. Because again, look, they got Marvel, they got Star Wars. They can go crazy. Yeah. But again, it all depends on how good the the shows are the movies are they have to be three billion dollars it better be good it so better be good you're hitting on a key point which is you know we've talked about star wars in the past and i think disney has something of a star wars dilemma they don't quite know what to do with it other than they know it's valuable ip the best thing going in star wars right now is the mandalorian that's and season two looks amazing so this announcement i wonder if it gives them a little more freedom to say you know i know we talked about a couple of these star wars movies the ryan johnson trilogy i think taika watiti's got a film maybe kevin feige's got a film maybe we back that down a bit and we move a little bit more of that toward the streaming platform because think about it, three billion dollars to your point just very simplistically budget for avengers endgame i believe was close to 300 million dollars so mm -hmm. 10 end games. This, if you just wanted to put in simple terms, you got 10 <laughs> end games each year with the dividend alone. Yeah, yeah. That's how you can think about it. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to take a fraction of that and do a couple more Star Wars series or movie quality, you know, Star Wars productions. Hey, look, as I say, you know, Star Trek has always been a television vehicle. That's where it's been best. Maybe Star Wars for the moment, because they don't have the, the Skywalker saga anymore to play with. Maybe the Star Wars franchise is best served being on streaming in a television type format for the near term. Bob Chapek is palpatine in this. <laughs> He's playing the long, we are, this is the first order. <laughs> well, please tell me there's not like a thousand clones of this dude hanging out on some planet. We don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> We're not going to get that disaster we're not gonna get that we're not gonna get that but he's this is the long game yeah this is the future and this is what they're preparing themselves for um certainly in order to get the subscriptions because the long game is getting that money every month guaranteed and more with subscribers right that is to keep that going and the way to do that again is the content. And now they have, because they have Marvel, because they have Star Wars, they can put, you want a Star Wars? I right. here it here it comes. Next year, we're shooting Obi-Wan. They said it, confirmed it. I have no doubt that they're gonna be focused on what to do um with the Star Wars franchise. I think they can certainly look forward now and give us not so far in the past with nice of the old republic because we've been hearing you know in our last podcast which i haven't posted i will um we spoke about the future and 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 the past of of a star wars that they are certainly not thinking too much with, about the future because they don't necessarily know where to go with this right and now they they think that giving us prequels and for me 
the Star Wars, the first trilogy was a beautiful trilogy. And the second part of that, I, I even accept the first prequels. This last three certainly doesn't do it for me. I've, and I've seen it, not that they're horrible movies, but in terms of that feeling that you got when you first saw Wars The New Hope and Empire Strike Back and these other films, it, it, does, it certainly doesn't feel like George Lucas. And I think they ha they're going to have to bring him in. <laughs> they're going to have to bring him in to consult, do something to bring his, this is his baby, man. He started this. <laughs> they gave him two, how much? How many billions? Two? Four. Two, four billion dollars to a single man for Star Wars. It took four billion for him to say. <laughs> yeah, and but he that, did it still thinking he was going to consult on the last three, and then kind of was ushered to the side. You know, when that ultimately went to camera. Yeah, man. And if anything, just tell you, 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 here, do it, do it, you do it, you know, and, and let's talk about it. Let's get it, have some conversation, have some dinner with Kevin. I'm sure he has some steaks ready, <laughs> you know? Are you, are you suggesting the Lucas cut for the last trilogy? Is that where you're headed with? Hey, <laughs> you heard it here, folks. You heard it here. If those guys can stay alive, because I don't know if, if if Mr. Luke Skywalker is going to be alive, because he's going to kill him anyway. Uh, so they can certainly do something. But hey, bring him in if you're going to do something. Let him cook something up, because where you're going with, with it, it doesn't feel the same. And they were on the right track. But because of fans, them not knowing what to do, they gave us what we got. They gave us Palpatine again. I don't know how this dude survived, but whatever. Um, so certainly listen, what Disney is doing again is looking towards the future and I'm very excited and looking forward to what they have to do next up the Spider-Verse. There are rumors out there. There are still rumors that hasn't been confirmed, but come on. The ink is still drying probably. Tobey Maguire and, uh, Andrew Garfield are the rumor is that they are signing up to be in the spider-verse now i say the spider-verse and not spider-man 3 because i don't know i don't <sighs> brian i'm not looking forward to seeing spider-man 3 and we have this chaos happening in front of us it, it, they can't deliver this like here and then when we get it we're not satisfied because it wasn't thought through well it, they, they didn't they didn't give us that storyline that led to this so that people are not, it's, it can't go too fast. It can't be Matrix, Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> it can't be Met Matrix Revolutions. It was too quick. These people are talking too quick. I don't understand what's going on. It can't be that. Um, I certainly think that people want it, but I'm afraid of how they're going to deliver it. What were your thoughts? Because we knew this was going to happen again. If you've been watching the podcast, you've been watching the show, we foreshadow here. And uh, we knew this was happening. And we weren't surprised. But what do you think? Uh, what was your reaction to this, to this rumor? Well, no surprise. I mean, I think Kevin Feige has been hot on the trail of this. I actually think, you know, this feels much more natural. I mean, these two actors played the part played it well in different iterations you know amazing spider-man one and two not people's favorite movies but andrew garfield's interpretation great. of peter parker was one of the best parts of I those so. films so i think it, it, it's going to get a high approval rating to see them back you know the nostalgia comes back to see them back i think the obvious questions we talked about is where does this go is this a sack of cash for a couple days shoot put on the costume again we have you know we kind of go down memory lane for for a five to ten minute scene uh, for each of them and, and we're done or is this we have an idea and we have an idea that we want to build through a couple of films or appearances and it ultimately leads to them having a a, a meaningful role in a storyline somewhere where Tom Holland's Peter Parker needs the other Peter Parkers or you know in order to complete an objective I think that's what remains to be seen is how how far down the rabbit hole are they looking to go with these because this is not the you know, celebrity cameo central 
I, rumors that we've heard, right? These are characters who you could, in theory, use in some way beyond just a, a quick appearance and tip of the cap for the work they've done. So I'm curious, and usually when Kevin gets this excited about something like this and really kind of dives in, he usually has a plan behind it. So got to give him the benefit of the doubt here. That is the key. Kevin Feige is the key that opens up the door for hope, right? If he sticks to not necessarily, I'm, I won't call it the formula, but the exposition that he, you know, puts out towards this bigger storyline. If that's missing, I don't know how it'll be received. You have the Sinister Six coming. Everybody wants the Sinister Six. Everybody wants Spider the Spider-Verse. That is a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's a lot. And granted, you can understand why Sony wanted to keep Spider because you have all this. But Sony didn't know how to deliver it. So they said, you know, fine. You know what, Kevin, help us out. Let's make this deal happen and boom, we're doing it. Um, Spidey has that 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 universe that you can sustain for quite a while because of the, the vast number of, of characters that are in that world. And it would have been a shame for them not to have that relationship with the MCU because if had that, that had not that been the case, Sony would have had a problem because all they needed was one to fail for everybody to turn. Yeah. <clears throat> so we'll see. I think it's not going to be a one-time thing. I hope it's not. I hope that they have multiple appearances uh, in different movies to come to that Spider-Verse situation. Because that's a big event. And I don't think we're going to probably get that in Spider-Man 3. I mean, we're going to get Miles Morales, man. That he's going to be probably hinted at or show up in Spider-Man 3. I hope we get hints of that and hope it's not the full-blown Miles Morales because that's like, you, I think Marvel's going to go about it the right way. Kevin is the key. I think, can I throw one last thing in? I just thought about it and not connected to anything, but it, mm -hmm. we, it's funny how things come full circle. So Tobey Maguire played Spider-Man from 2002 to 2007. His director in those three movies, Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi is now the director of... Doctor Strange, Strange. 2, the multiverse central oh, movie for the MCU. I just pointed out, I know nothing, but yes. <laughs> point out that we are now in a world where Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire are both back as part of the multiverse Listen, MCU. And he continues to say he feels bad about Spider-Man 3. It wasn't him, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't him. It was the studio. This is what happens when studios get involved. They think that that's all they think about. And Sam Raimi loves the character. And now, and I said when he was announced as uh, the director of, uh, of Doctor Strange, I said, ooh, he's close to where he really wants to be. <laughs> 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 and hey, come on, man. The writing's on the wall. The writing's on the wall. So let me get this straight. We have WandaVision sort of an introduction to the multiverse. It, it, Dr. Strange shows up, we lead into Dr. Strange 2, Multiverse of Madness. He shows up in Spider-Man now? The, it's right there. The threads are connected. You're definitely seeing the crossover. It's, yeah, it, it's yeah. right there. Yeah. And uh, let's see how this all plays out. I, I have high hopes for it because of Kevin. And um, I just want to add one more thing. You had mentioned James Cameron before with Avatar and people not being able to use the technology at that time to really give us a 3D experience or a movie experience like the one we had with the first Avatar. Um, now we're going underwater. This is totally disconnected from what we're saying. But James Cameron, my fear with avatar is that people have forgotten because you know people tried to bring back although it was obviously a far apart blade runner uh now we're getting doing we don't know what we're going to get with that are people going to get into it i don't know um but avatar you know was great when it first came out because it gave us a movie experience on like we had experience since the matrix i think right then the Matrix went down the toilet. <laughs> I was, I was yeah, if, we ever do, if we ever do most disappointing sequels, 
Matrix oh, Revolution. That's, that's, that's probably, for my lifetime is probably oh, yeah, the most oh, yeah, disappointed oh, yeah, I've oh, ever yeah, been leaving. Oh yeah. Theater. My fear is that Avatar could fall into that situation. I hope not, but James Cameron, he's he's an innovator. He, he's an innovative dude, and he, this is his life, his passion, and and his whole thing is to provide a movie experience unlike we've ever seen before. And I think with Avatar, and I guess this is why he's been waiting so long because the technology wasn't there to really provide that vision that he had in his brain. Now he's like, y'all wait and see. So I'm hoping to get that. All I can say about James Cameron at this point is Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 2, True Lies, Titanic, the documentary, Titanic, the movie, Avatar. If you're going to bet against him, yeah, you're going to get really good odds <laughs> at this point. So if he says, I have something that I think is truly groundbreaking and I can tell it in the world of Pandora... Who am I to disagree with of him? Course. I will give him the benefit of the doubt. Of course, of course, of course. Next up, the Batman film set leaks. I was dissecting this. And I have to say, man, and I read this in the comments when they posted those, those photos of Colin Farrell. They said it. I forget. I got to find out who said it. Give the Oscar to that makeup artist already. <laughs> Yo. Brian, you can't tell me you weren't impressed when you saw that. I've been pretty much impressed with everything to do with this film. And I think in some ways, I don't think Colin Farrell takes the part unless the prosthetics were this good. I think it, it, in some ways, he's a, he's, a, he's done some great stuff. And oh, I, yeah, he's, in he's some ways, I feel like it would almost take away from things if you knew it was him. He has such distinctive features. Yes. So the fact that he's completely hidden I think it works great for the character. It just makes me so much more curious as to what. Oh yeah, doing. oh yeah. And then you see uh, Miss Selena Kyle on the arm of uh, what's his, is it, Mister uh, Car Carmine Falcone? Car right? he, she, Falcone. Yeah. John Turturro. Yeah, yes. Fantastic actor. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, what are we watching? The only, you know, when they announced her as Catwoman, I said. I have not been disappointed with any casting that they've done for this film. Everything has been like, except for Colin Farrell, because if initially you were like, damn, he's gonna have to gain weight. Not at all, my friends. We don't need you to do anything. We're gonna put this stuff on you and you're gonna look great and you won't kill it. They're looking for his acting ability, which I'm, that dude, is, is he's just fantastic at what he does. Jeffrey Wright, we've said an abundance, I've given abundance of praise and I, again, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it each time I, I, I get I get the chance to. He's going to be the first guy if he's involved a lot in the Gotham series that they're putting on HBO Max if he's in that, his performance in that, in this movie the chances are, the chances are huge, I think, for him to win an Oscar and an Emmy for the same role. Wow. So I'm, I'm putting that out there. Um, the one thing that I hear people sort of having a negative thing to say about all this is Bruce Wayne and the way Robert Pattinson looks in that role. I sort of agreed with a lot of the things that people have said. He doesn't look Bruce Wayne-ish. He doesn't look suave. He doesn't look like he can bag one in a day. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? He looks he looks like a college kid, like a freshman. He looks young. He looks, young. Young. He looks, yeah. he looks that, yes, he looks young. He just doesn't look suave. He doesn't look like there, it doesn't look like there is a difference between Bruce Wayne and Batman. And that's what I'm looking like you said in, in in previous shows, you're looking for that Clark Kent and Superman. Those are two different guys, right? When he presents himself, he, he he acts a certain way. Will we see that with Bruce Wayne? Is he going to be moody all the time? Then that's Batman, you know. You know. Yeah. So so something to keep in mind though, and it's notable, we have not actually we have no idea what he's like as Bruce Wayne yet. Yes. Right? 
the the trailer dialogue is all Batman. It's no Bruce talking. It's only you see him, but you don't hear him. You don't feel what his personality is like. And so we've we've heard a lot about the detective side of this, but we haven't really we have no frame of reference. So my sense when I see this, and I understand the critique, I had the same initial knee jerk, but part of me feels like it's so obvious that it has to be deliberate. And if it had, if it's deliberate, then there might be something behind that to where you're like, aha, this makes sense. He's in year yeah. two of being Batman at a certain age. And that's why he's almost incomplete as both the superhero and as the Bruce Wayne persona. So I'm willing to give it a pass because everything else has been yeah. so top notch. The hair yeah. is probably the one that stands out. I was trying to think, was this like, was it the old like Batman Beyond animated? Like there was one Batman Beyond like animated series or Batman animated series where I feel like they did go with the dark kind of floppy yeah. hair, or whether it was Bruce or Terry McGinnis. I can't remember yes. which one had it, but it it it's not my favorite. But I I feel I like there's it, design it to it. Terry McGinnis. Yeah. So there, so I feel like there's probably design to it. So I'm willing to see it. And the other thing I want to say about this because Matt Reeves made a really interesting comment on fandom where he said and it ties to your thing about gotham the series he said his goal with this movie was to make gotham not feel like any city you know so chris nolan it was chicago and pittsburgh but if you knew chicago it was very chicago like the yeah. buildings they use the landmarks were all there this i agree with i look at this and the first trailer reminded me of seven so more kind of like a thriller yeah. horror film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these set photos albeit their photos Reminded me more of like Brian De Palma's Untouchables, like more like a gangster movie from like the 20s, just the look of it, like how yeah. people were dressed. So yeah. really has me fascinated because it just looks different than what maybe I would have expected, but in a good way. Like it makes me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. 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 So, um, whose funeral is it, by the way? Do we know? Um, I think the guy that um, the Riddler killed. Oh, yeah. Because the Riddler is there, right? There's like the yeah, shot yeah, yeah. of him in the background. Yeah. You remember that that scene in the in the in the trailer where the car comes in and almost strikes that kid and Bruce Wayne saves him. Yeah. I think this is the um, the beginning. Probably before that scene happens, they go in. I don't. I, I think that's what that is. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you, man. I think uh, obviously, look is not looks. You know, you know, it looks that way, but we have to see what it really is going to be. And again, we've been wrong with Michael Keaton. We've been wrong, wrong with Heath, Le Heath Ledger. You know, it's not all about how it looks, but how they do it, that's that's what we're looking forward to. Yeah. Um, and the last topic, Hemsworth wants to be Wolverine. And we are talking about Mr. Luke Hemsworth. Mr. Luke Hemsworth threw his hat into the threw his name into the hat and he is better than most of the people who are out there casting for Wolverine saying this should, this should be this guy this should be. he's and I'll tell you why because he's short he's the shorter of all the, all the three brothers he's 511 um He's 39 years old. So you got, you possibly can get six to eight years with him, depending on how you use him. He can, he's 39, so he can get, you know, a little help, you ask you. You ain't gonna tell me that was all natural, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not, you're not. He can, he can get, he can get there. He can look, he, he's short, he can get stocky. I, it, there's, there's pictures out there of him, I'll look for one of him stocking. Can he play the role? That audition is key. He, I'll, you know, just looking at him, he, he, he reminds me a little bit of, of Tom Berenger, a young Tom Berenger. And can he, can, can he deliver the lines? Like if I was casting, can he convince me of Wolverine? I don't know. I know who can. And Brian, I've mentioned it. If you've listened to our show, before you got on, Zach McGowan. I think he's perfect. He's, I think he's 6'1 or six feet, I think. So he's not that much taller, but he certainly has the look and he certainly has the delivery 
of a convincing Wolverine. What do you think about Hemsworth? And have you heard of Zach McGuff? Um, um, you know, I, I hate to judge right away because we've definitely seen where that can lead you to bad places on castings. But my initial reaction was no thanks. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Like unless unless Chris has some favors he can call in. Um, I, I don't know that I need another Hemsworth. It, and, and you know, the, the thing, he will. The thing, <laughs> the thing I was thinking about was okay. Hugh Jackman played this role a certain way. And I thought about like, what did I like most? What did I like least? And I guess if they're gonna go next iteration of this, I would rather they lean more in the direction of the way Wolverine was portrayed in the animated series, which was more intensity, almost more unhinged, like more on the edge and a little less vulnerable. Um, Cal Dodd actually was the guy who voiced Wolverine, and he always sounded like he was, you know, about to... That, to, to, to me, that was Wolverine. Right. I feel like Hugh leaned a little bit more toward the vulnerability the more he played the character. He humanized it a little bit more the longer he went on. And I, so I feel like for an act, I'm looking for kind of this raw intensity and power, and I'm not convinced, quite honestly, any of the Hemsworth brothers that that's their style. Like, even Chris, I think his gift is comedy more so than it is, you know, deep, dark drama. So uh, you see, uh, um, ex uh, that movie extraction? That, yeah. Yeah. But, but he doesn't have a lot of dialogue in that though. True, true, true. That's a physical role. And yes, he's yes, a great yes, yes. physical actor. Yes, yes, yes. But his, as a voice actor, I, he's pretty funny. Like that's probably <laughs> why Ragnarok for a lot of people worked because it leaned yeah. into him. Being, so I think for Wolverine though, I want somebody who, you never know in any moment in time is he going to stick the claws in his in the good guy or the bad guy right that's part of the the, the allure of that character so i i'm hoping it goes more that route and i don't know that any of the hemsworths have that quality they're almost all too good if that makes yeah. sense the, the feel of them is too good so yeah yeah my, yeah my yeah, yeah. i see i see what you're saying yeah um yeah because with this with this next iteration of wolverine it has to be it has to be different not just in how he looks, but how he, how he is, because Wolverine is a savage man. He's yeah. a he's a murderer. <laughs> he's a killer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and and he's an he's not necessarily here. At the end of the day, he does the right thing, um, but he struggles with that because of all he's been through. Um, so, yeah, again, if I was casting. I say I mean I, I gotta see him. I, he has to convince me. Read the read this here. <laughs> Go. Can can he convince me? I don't know. I don't know. I think it'll be tough. But because I, I I looked him up and I saw him in some videos and see how he acts and stuff. And uh, it's it's questionable whether he can deliver that performance. But um, we'll see. They'll they'll give him a shot. They'll give him a shot, and they're gonna be like. Uh, we got this other movie called <laughs> <laughs> it's on Disney plus though. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's what they'll give him. Um, but Zach McGon, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I don't think I've seen his work. I, I looked him up after you told you sent me the name, but I've not seen him as an actor. Look him up in some videos on YouTube, Zach McGowan and just the way he delivers his lines, his look, he can go there in terms of intensity. And that's what this character needs is intensity. And like, is he's borderline like, you can't, they can't, he can't be a PG-13 type of character, in my opinion. Yeah. That's one of the things I'm afraid of with this character because he's so popular and, you know, he has claws. He looks cool. Do we sell it in the Disney store? <laughs> you know, and he's a killer. He's a murderer. You know, it, it, that's hard. That's hard to. Uh, I don't know how that goes, but I think the success of Logan is helpful in that regard because yeah. that movie was so dark and was mm -hmm. R rated, heavily R rated, and it worked so well and made so much money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. think that actually helps give you the studio comfort that they can make this a dark R-rated character and have it sell. These are the things in the news that people are talking about. 
Um, some of these things we already knew was going to happen. If you've heard our previous podcast, where we talk about this stuff. We foreshadow a lot. Um, and some of the things that are, again, not surprising and some of the things that um, surprised us and we, we can't wait for. And some of the things we haven't really found the right person to do Wolverine. It's just, it's, it's going to be difficult because Hugh Jackman left the legacy that mm-hmm. is a high bar. Is a high bar, yeah. and and they can't, cannot afford to bring his popularity down. You just can't. No, but the the worst thing they could do is try to recapture Hugh Jackman. Yeah, that, that never works. Yeah, like they, yeah. So the, the direction they go has to be different. I don't. Whatever choice they make, it has to be different. The reason why you know Jack Nicholson Joker, Joaquin Phoenix Joker, and Heath Ledger Joker work is they're different. None of those people as actors is leaning into the other to find inspiration. So yeah, I see a lot of these side by side photos of like who looks like Hugh Jack. That's the wrong thing to be looking at. Like find yeah, a new man. Identity. And and yeah, and that's the and, and again that's the the mark he left on the character in people's minds is just hard it's Christopher, for well Christopher Reeve is the poster child for this right the ultimate yeah. every picture you see winds up being a side by side with Christopher Reeve and I get it but to set success has to come from finding a new a new direction yeah yeah and that's probably going to be the next topic of discussion in our next uh nerd gen report where we talk about uh what needs to be done in terms of story with Superman? Um, what storylines can we bring to the to film or HBO Max? We don't know. Uh, that will bring back that Superman that we got with Christopher Reeve when we, we couldn't wait for the next Superman. Superman 1977 is a classic. You always get the same. You, you can't watch it every day, but if you watch it, Every five, ten years, when you watch it that first time, you get that sort of same feeling, man. Like, wow, that's Superman. So, um, thank you for joining us. Again, we're going to go in a new direction here on this show and um, try to give you... This is what this show is about. Let me just lay it out there, being that this is the first episode of this show. This show is about bringing people up to speed if you're not up on the news every single day. And we're giving you pretty much our perspective on what this news means. We're not always right. Most of the time we are. <laughs> we, we, we're on track. I'll say we're on track. We may not be first, but we coming in close second or either first all the time because we, we're up on this every single day. We may not talk about it every single day because we ain't got that kind of time. You know, we, we wear a lot of hats. <laughs> and so we're every week, if you tune in, you'll get a rundown of what occurred. What's, what were the most important things that we got out of last week's um, um, news? And once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification button and um, enjoy yourselves. Be safe. Good night, good evening, and good morning. Thank you. <laughs>